when I stand up here and I look out at the congregation in Southside, I see, I see family, I see friends, I see good relationships, I see people who encourage me and strengthen me. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for you being here and spending this time together with us as we open our Bibles and we study through God's Word and we sing songs of praise to Him. Uh, it, is, it is the highlight of my week to be here with you all. Uh, there are those of you that are visiting with us. We are so thankful for you being here and uh, joining along with us in our, in our worship and in our study, and we hope that as we spend this time together that you too feel the, the family that we are here, and if that be your desire to, to know more about this family, to come into it through the, the ways in which Christ has offered us to become a part of his family, to join us in the work that is here, we would very much look forward to talking with you about that. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. I thank Luke for reading that passage to us. Um, as we are going to really not spend a whole lot of time in it, but we're going to draw some, some points from it that I think are going to really help us get our study underway this morning. So in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, uh, you, you really see something happening here that I don't think we immediately connect with what's on the board behind me. The past two months, we've been talking about evangelism. In our yearly theme of Ignite, we have focused in July and in August on igniting in evangelism, igniting in sharing the gospel with others, igniting in letting the world know about the blessings that Christ has bestowed upon us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you were not here for those lessons, I encourage you to go to our website Go to livingischristians.com and you can find those sermons, you can listen to those, you can try to maybe help you to, to flesh out and understand what we're going to talk about a little bit more today. But really what we're going to do today is start to wrap that up. We've spent two months on that and at the end of two months I realized that is not near enough time to really do evangelism uh, any, any good service. Uh, but I mentioned something at the beginning of this, and that is creating a culture of evangelism. And so what I hope to be able to continue to do is speak about evangelism more regularly. We're going to move on past it in our Ignite series, but we're going to continue to bring it up because that is part of who we are, a part that I hope is made more clear through the course of this lesson. But in Luke chapter 10, you have eight words that really stand out. Eight words that really draw your attention through the course of this, this story. And we know the story so well. The, the Good Samaritan, you've, you've probably heard that and read that a hundred times. We know that story. But in this account, there's eight things that stand out. Eight words that Jesus, is, Jesus uses that, that at least draw my attention. The first two words that he uses are love God. When he has called, come, <coughs> excuse me, when he has come and, and asked this question about the, the greatest commandments, his response is love God as being one of the foremost commandments. One of the greatest commandments that we have is to love the God who has created us. Love the God who is, is ruler over all things. Love the God who truly deserves out of everything that that we might look at in this world, the only one that truly deserves our love. Love God. The next three words that he uses is love your neighbor. And what's different between that is God deserves our love. A lot of times our neighbors seem like they don't. But he says you love those who are undeserving of that love. In that we are reflecting what he has done for us. When we were undeserving of love, he loved us. And so he starts off in this in this account, love your God and love your neighbor. And the question that is asked by the man trying to justify himself is, well, who is my neighbor? And if you noticed in Luke's reading, Jesus didn't answer that question. Instead, he tells a story. And at the end of the story, he says, which one of these men acted like a neighbor? I'm not going to tell you who your neighbor is. I think the implication from that is you should know your neighbor is anyone that you come into contact with. I'm going to ask you, who's acting more like a neighbor? To which they responded, it's the, the, the Samaritan. The one who, who helped the man that was in need. And that brings us to the last couple of words. 
go and do. This sets up this sets up maybe what is the foundation of evangelism. Love God, love your neighbor, go and do. And what I want to spend the rest of our time looking at today are how God's words continue to direct us towards this end. Because we might want to do that, but might feel like we are inadequate, might feel like we are not capable of, we might not even want to do that. But God's Word has something to say about all of those. And we're going to just spend a little bit of time looking at six passages this morning. I'm going to go ahead and put them on the board. You'll be able to tell when we're getting close to the end. I'm going to have all six of them right up there. We're going to look at six passages. And I hope that at the end of this, we will be a little bit more committed to what we have spent the last couple of months talking on, and hopefully at the end we will have a little bit better idea of how we can go and get that started in our lives. So let's go ahead and begin. Let's go ahead and jump right into this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Now you've probably read this before, and you're thinking that is not a verse about evangelism. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You might read that and say, that is not a verse about evangelism. That's a verse about being a good person. That's a verse about doing the right thing and letting other people see that. You shine your light. And at its very core, that is what evangelism is. Letting the light of God shine into the world around you. But there is a difference between being a good person and being an evangelistic person. There's all sorts of, (laughs) excuse me, there's all sorts of good people the world over but they're not always being very evangelistic. So what's the difference between being a good person and being a, an evangelistic person? This verse tells us that we are good people on purpose. They say we are good people with a purpose. If you notice in that, in that uh, reading, he said, let your good work shine. You need to be doing good things to show the good person that you are so that shines out into the world. Not so they look at you and say, you know, I remember when you did this for me, you're, you're just a really swell person for doing that. There's not enough of that in the world. But so you can have an opportunity to draw their eyes and their hearts to the God who has made you and who is directing you and what it is to be good, and who is leading you in righteousness. The end of that verse said, so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the very first verse we're going to look at is the Bible directs us towards evangelism, saying just let your example, let the things that you do, let the way that you act shine into the world as a light that draws people towards God. Be an example on purpose. Next verse we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 10. And you notice that these are going to go right in line with one another, really. We're not going to be jumping back and forth a whole lot and make it easy to go along through this. So if you turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and look at verses 32 through 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So if Matthew 5 says, look, your example equates to evangelism. When you live a good life for the purpose of drawing people to God, you go and you do things with that intention that I'm going to somehow show you God. That you can turn your eyes to Him. That you can see what He has to offer you. He said, that is evangelism. But now we're going to ratchet it up a a, a spot because he's also going to say evangelism involves speaking. Evangelism involves using words as well. And specifically here, he says confessing his name, speaking the name of Jesus. How did he say that? He said, confess me before men and I'll confess you before God. That's a deal right there. 
Michael and Mickey are all about making deals. They make deals to make better business. And, and uh, with, with the camp last year, they made us a great deal on sausage and gravy and bacon. That deal doesn't reflect at all on the magnitude of the deal that Jesus just made with us in the gospel. He said, say my name here, and I'll say your name there. That is a fantastic deal. You're not going to find a better deal than that in all the world, in all your life. And then the flip side it brings up a, a startling thought as well. Deny me here, and I will deny you there. We like the first part of that a lot. But we get to that second part and we go, wow, that's really bad though. That's really bad. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't deny Jesus. In John's class, we just got through talking about the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist is just that, anti-Christ, opposed to Christ. It is him who is denying that Christ is the Son of God. And how John said there were many Antichrists already in that day. And we look at this passage and we say, that's what that's talking about. But in context, in context, he said, you say my name, I say your name. You deny me, I deny you. In context, he's talking about not speaking up when we should be speaking up. You ever been in that moment? In that moment when you realize this is the time I need to say the name of Jesus. This is the time I need to bring his name out. In this situation, when this person, they need to hear what he has to offer. This is the time that I need to let them know about the name of Jesus. And I keep that reserved. And I don't speak up. It's what he's talking about here. And here's the thing, there's not a single one of us batting a thousand when it comes to evangelism, not even Jason Bridgman. None of us are batting a thousand when it comes to, to evangelism. I don't say these things so that we will become scared of our reality. I don't say these things to stomp on our toes. And if anyone ever does, that's not the purpose of this pulpit. That's not the purpose of what we are here to do. We're here to talk about how serious this is. We're here to talk about the, 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 the Bible is here to reveal to us the stakes of the life that we are in. And he said, there is great blessing for you when you will confess my name. But we need to know how serious it is to reserve that and hold that back. So he tells us thus far, be an example and be that example on purpose with a purpose and speak the name of Jesus into the places that it needs to be spoken into, into the situations and the moments when His name needs to be on our lips and going out into the world. But in our next verse, Matthew chapter 28, we know this one. We know this one so well. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He has said, be an example. Be someone who speaks his name. Be someone who is joined in to the mission. It's not going to get much more clear than this passage right here. Jesus says, I have the authority, so you go and you tell people about me. You go and tell people about what I have done and what I offer. You go and tell them about baptism and what that brings. You go and teach them the things that I have said. And he ends that saying, and guess what? I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to be there with you. When you are on this mission, I am there with you. I have all authority over everything, and I'm walking beside you as we go and do this mission together. And some people are going to look at that and say, you know, that's important, but that's not for me. We talked about this earlier on in the in, in, in last month. He's talking to the 11 right there. And he is talking to the 11 right there. Say context is the most important thing as we study through the Bible. We keep it in its context. He is speaking to his 11 apostles. And he is telling them, you go and you join this mission. And I'm going to be with you. And we talked about how Paul 
also was pulled into that mission. And Paul goes on to teach us in passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, saying, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. You join me. You join the, the rest of us as ambassadors of Christ. You join us in that. But I'm not going to appeal to Paul today. I'm going to appeal to somebody else. Go over to Acts chapter 8 with me. <clears throat> and read with me verses 1 through 4. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Now we're talking in context about Stephen who was put to death for preaching the gospel. He is not one of the eleven. He is a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, and he could not keep his mouth shut about this. When it came time, he was going to confess Jesus, and he is martyred for it. And in verse 8, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. I ask you all a question this morning. Do we have any teenager evangelists in here? any young teenage evangelists in this room today? Well, let's really get uncomfortable. Do we have any female evangelists in the room today? Any of you confident say, I am a female evangelist? Because that's what Acts chapter 8 is talking about. In context, again, what do we see happening? The context of verse 4 is those who are scattered went about preaching the word. But who was scattered? We go up to verse 3. He says it was the church. The church made up of men and women who are being dragged off by Paul and thrown into prison. This is who is scattered. And they go about and they start preaching. And it's not the 11 because the 11 stay in Jerusalem. Verse 2 tells us that the apostles stay there. It is the men and women of the church that are thrown out into the world. What do they do? When persecution arises, they go and they tell the world about this Jesus who will not be persuaded to be removed from their tongues, who has led them with strength, who is with them every step of the way. Persecution is not Satan's greatest tool against evangelism. Comfort is. When things get hard, God's people have notoriously looked at the power that Christ has in their life to lead them and say, I have authority over that. I rule over that. I've conquered that. And they follow. And so whether you are male or female, whether you are teenage or octogenarian, what we find there is evangelism is for all. No, this is not authority for women to be preachers, but yes, it is authority for you to go and spread the news. Go and tell the world Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King. He is our Lord. And remember, He says, I'm right there with you when you're doing that. I am following along and I am with you on this mission. So confess my name and set that example have a purpose. As we continue, go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I want you to think now about what the Bible reveals to us about what was going on and way this, this idea of evangelism for everybody was being incorporated into the churches of that day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 6 through 8. It says, you also become imitators of us Excuse me, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. Just imagine for a moment, Paul writes you a letter. He says, I was over in your neck of the woods the other day. I was over near Somerset, 
And I went into this little community and I said that I wanted to talk with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I started to, to, to try to, to share with them and they stopped me. They said, listen, whoa, 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 we, we already know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard all about the Lord Jesus Christ. We know about His death and we know about His resurrection. We know about the forgiveness that He offers us. We know about how we can have life through His name. We know about our Lord Jesus Christ because Southside will not stop talking about it. They have went all through Somerset and just everywhere you go. And so Paul's writing to you to say, guess what? I went into your neck of the woods or I went to the city over from you. I didn't have to say a thing because your faith is going out. That's what he writes to Thessalonica. He said, Thessalonica, evangelism has become such a part of your culture that we don't even have to say a word because your faith is going out into the world. That's a goal of ours here. I mentioned that in earlier lessons, to have a culture of evangelism where evangelism is spoken about. Evangelism is encouraged. Evangelism, opportunities for it are created. And we've started that in ways. We have those cards in the back. If you are not familiar with those, when you leave this, these double doors and you go out, you will see, you'll see these small cards that you can take, business cards that you can take just with, with simple questions. Would you like to have a Bible study? Would you like to know more about forgiveness? Would you like to know what you must do to be saved? Are you looking for a church family? We're trying to create a, a culture where evangelism is something that is just a part of us. Soon, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later, we're going to have some small books in which we can take and they can assist us in studying with others through the gospel. This is the message of the gospel. And not only are we going to have those books, but we've talked about taking time to show you how to use those books. Setting time aside that we can study through them and, and be, we can all be prepared if the need arises to say, hey, look, you want to know more about the gospel? I would love to study that with you. Just me and you. You don't have to come to my church. You don't have to come sit down with somebody you don't know. Just me and you. Let's talk together about what the Word of God is saying. Purpose-driven culture for every member. What would tomorrow look like if just one more person today said, you know what, I want to bring someone to Christ. I want that to be a part of who I am. I want to hold up the truth. I want to share the gospel with the people I meet. This is the highlight of my week because things, things are so bright when I'm around you all. I'm excited to see how much brighter they'll be tomorrow and the next day as this culture permeates our lives. So maybe thinking about those things, you go, that's what I want. I want this I want to be an example with a purpose. I want to confess his name. I want to be a part of this mission that is for every single one of us as we change the culture to more and more reflect our love and desire for God and for the people around us to know him. I want to go and do that. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Where I grew up, there was a man who preached there. His name was Robert Spear. And Robert had a, a way that I think most, if not all, teenagers are familiar with in presenting the message in which you have these, these phrases that you're just like, I, I know they're coming, and you're ready to hear them. Phrases like, let's stand and sing. In conclusion. They're the words that you're like, man, I know it's coming, and I'm just ready because I'm ready for this to be over. So there was a young boy that worshipped with, with us, where uh, me and, and Holly, where she, was, she was there at this time. He worshipped with us there. He was uh, probably the age of maybe Madden. 
And, and we were during the, the, the prayer, and it gets to the end of the prayer. With that amen is spoken, he jumps up out of his pew, and he rushes to those double doors in the back of the building, which led to the outside, and he kicks them open, and with his triumphant, yes! And he had to come back in because it was the first prayer. <laughs> and I remember going, I'm right there with you, though. I'm right there with you. I'm ready for this to be over. Because Robert was going to say the same thing that he had said the week before and the same thing that he said the week before that. He was going to talk about how if you miss heaven, you've missed everything. I'd heard him say it a hundred times. He was going to talk about how the, the church needed elderships and it needed leadership. And he had beat this, this horse to death. He was going to tell us how our, our words were like arrows. When you let them go, you can't bring them back. I had heard the points. I knew the points. I was so tired of hearing the points. And I'm ashamed. Ashamed of my attitude towards it at that age. Because Robert wasn't trying to make me a better person. Micah and Hunter and Ryder and Jackson and Kylie and Izzy and all of you young people here, I'm not trying to make you better people either. Robert was trying to entrust in me something to go out into the world and make it look a little bit more like Christ. He was trying to teach me so that I could go and share with others that if you've missed heaven, you've missed everything. You might miss a ball game. You might miss uh, a, a, a party. You might miss something that is exciting in this life. But if you've missed heaven, you've missed it all. He was trying to teach me that the church needs leadership. The church needs a, to, to function in the way that God has made it function. It needs men who will, who will stand up and do the work of shepherding this flock. And it needs men who will stand up and do the work of, of serving the flock as deacons. The church needs these things so that it can work in the way that will stand out from the rest of this world to show that we are a family built on the pattern of God. We want you to come and become a part of it. And he was reminding me that my words matter. I can't just go and say what I want to say because I might not ever be able to draw that word back and I might not ever be able to undo the damage that it does. That it, that it does. He wasn't trying to make me a better person. He was trying to equip me. As Ephesians 4 says, an elder or an a evangelist should do. Equip me for the work of ministry. And so I've talked for two weeks, two months two months about evangelism, and maybe you've felt like, I have heard all these points before. And I'm sure that there will be things that I say that become very mundane, and you begin to think, I know where this is going, and I'm just, I wish he would speak about something else. The question I had to come to realize was, was I ready to go and teach that? Was I equipped? If I wasn't equipped, and I needed to sit down and I need to get out my pen and paper, and I need to start taking notes, and I need to become someone who was equipable. Because somebody was trying to help me get to the point where I could go and do exactly what 2 Timothy 2 is talking about. Share with others the faithful things of God. And as we think about what the Bible reveals to us about evangelism, these are six things that stand out to me. It reveals to us that God desires for us to be an example on purpose. God desires for us to be people that are ready to speak his name and to put that into the world at the times and at the places that it needs to be put. He expects for us to join in on a mission that he himself is going to join in on, that he has all authority and he is going to be with us. He is calling us to see that that is not a mission for the evangelist. That is not a mission for just some, a few men that have the ability to speak well. It is a mission for all. That we go into the world and we spread the news of Jesus Christ to those we are around. It is revealing to us that that is a part of our life that can permeate every aspect until it is just the culture. When people say this church, they say that church is all about evangelism. And it is something that will not happen if we will not be equipable. If we will not take the time and take the effort to say, I want to do this, and I want to do it better. So how can I do that? And allow God's word to equip us. 
through the means in which he has provided for us. These are the things that I think of as we close out this lesson on evangelism. And maybe you are here today and you're going, that's what I want to do too. I want to be more like this, but I just don't know how. And I struggle with it. So let's close very quickly, quickly with just four points that I think help us do better at evangelism. These four points are, are taken from a, a really something to help you be better at being healthy. And, and that's been on my mind a lot because ever since COVID, I've not been very healthy. I want to do better. I want to eat better. I want to work out better. And so these are some things that have that help to keep that at the forefront of my mind, but I think they can also be repurposed and used in this way as well. Make it obvious. Make it easy. Track your progression. Find an encourager. So let's start with that first one. Make it obvious. Make evangelism obvious. How do I do that? Well, we can make it our purpose. Own that purpose in every room. We're going to reference John 4 in a minute, but when you go back to John 4, you find that there was a difference between the apostles who went in to the city versus the Samaritan woman who went into the city, and the difference was purpose. She went in with a purpose. I am going to tell people about Jesus. They come back with food. She comes back with souls, with people that need to hear that this is the Messiah. Make it our purpose in every room. And here's the thing. There's not a room that you're going to go in that this is not your purpose if you are a Christian, if you are an elect. When's the last time you came through those doors, you walked into this room today, and you went evangelism is about to go down in here. I'm going to make that happen. It's not very often that that's on my mind. There are people in here today that need to hear the gospel. There are people in here today who need to know their, their relationship with God and where it stands. And there are people in here today who have been saved by him, who have been washed of their sins, who have been called into a mission to share with the world. So find those people and encourage them, befriend them, study with them, talk to them about what God offers. Evangelism is our purpose in every room. So make it obvious to yourself, this is what I am here for. Next thing that I want us to consider is make it easy. Always be ready to share. So one thing that I like to do, well, no, no I don't like to do it, one thing that I should do is when I want to eat healthier, we can't have unhealthy snacks in the house. The house cannot be filled with, with pop and with chips and with cookies and all sorts of things that show up after kids' studies that I try to pawn off on you all to take them home with you. I can't have that in my house. And so Holly does a fantastic job of buying salads and buying healthy meats and, and vegetables to say, look, let's, let's eat better. And she has done this for a long time. And I remember whenever I used to work at Lockheed Martin, there was healthy food then in the house as well. But inevitably, I showed up to work without packing any of that healthy food. And so now when break time and lunch time comes, I have to either raid the vending machine. And once again, Michael, Mickey, great deals. I'm sorry, though, not very healthy. But I have to raid these places or I go down to the deli where it's all grease and, and carbs and say, I'm just going to eat one of these things. It's hard to eat healthy. It's hard because I'm making it hard. Instead of bringing those things that are there to make it easy, I can pack my lunch and bring that in. What does that have to do with evangelism? It's hard to sometimes open your mouth and say those things that need to be said in that moment. But we're trying to do things to make it easier, such as the cards that are in the back. Something to give you an opportunity to say, hey, look, just look like you're having a hard time today. I want to give you this card to let you know. There are people who have dealt with discouragement in the past. I'm one of them. I'd like to talk with you more about it, about what God has done to help me overcome that. We have those things. How many times have you been in that situation and thought, wow, I'd like to say something, and maybe I have something that makes it easier, makes it, me ready to share it, but it's, it's 20 miles away in the church building. Maybe you've not felt that way, but I have a bunch and so what have I started doing? I've started trying to load my wallet up. Every time I leave, I've got cards that are just sticking out the top of my wallet so that I can have those with me, so I can be ready to share. It makes it easier when it's right here with me. That does something else also. It helps me track my progression by creating personal accountability. 
How does it do that? It does it kind of like the apps that I use to try to eat less, and I probably don't use them enough. Apps that say, how many calories would you like to consume today? And I punch in 2,400 calories. I don't want to eat any more than that today. And so throughout the course of the day, as you put your meal in, it says, hey, guess what, Kyle? You've got 1,000 calories left. By the end of the day, it's usually a red number that says, guess what, Kyle? You went over that by 1,000 calories today. So when I pull my wallet out and I see these cards... I have something that reminds me, hey, Kyle, you've got a goal, you have a purpose, you have a mission, and you're not doing too great with it because you've got all these cards left in your wallet. Maybe you go and you grab five cards. You grab five cards. The, the card that is going, like, flying off the shelves is that service card. Maybe that's the card you That's the easiest one to hand out. But you decide, I'm going to hand out five cards. And when you pick those up and you get ready to put them in your wallet or in your purse, you just tell yourself, at the end of the month, these cards are not going to be in my wallet. They are not going to be in my purse. I am going to have handed out five cards to five different people today or this month. You know what that means? That means August 31st, when that comes around and you've got three cards left, you're going to be eating out for every single meal, trying to hand those to your waiters to make sure that you pass those out. But you're saying, I am not going to have these cards on me. The way we can track our progress. Now, you might think, I'm not a card guy. I don't, I don't, do, I don't need those things. I'm just going to do that example. I'm just going to set that example. I'm just going to live that life. And I'm not saying this is the only way you have to do it. What I'm asking you is, at the risk of sounding like I'm completely going back against what I said last week, what's your number going to be at the end of the year? You might go, hey, whoa, 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 this is not about salesmanship. This is not about numbers. You're right, it's not. But it is all about growth. It's all about doing better and pushing yourself to progress. What's your number going to be at the end of the year? If I have no goal, I have no mission, I'm just going to try to to say something to someone, maybe it'll be great. Maybe you'll just do more and more every year and continue to share the gospel. If you will take five cards and hand those five cards out every month, in the year you will have told 60 people about the good news of Jesus Christ. You will have told 60 people that there is a church that loves him and holds his name up with honor and wants to teach them about who he is and what he has to offer them. Then come December, you go, you know what? I think next year, I'm not going to do five. I'm going to do eight. And then you're going to have spread the gospel with how many, Michael? 96. He is so good. I was like, I don't think for a second I'm going to mess him up, but maybe I was a little bit hoping I would. 96. And every year you can have a way to track that and say, how am I doing in evangelism? Am I, am I kind of letting this go by the wayside? Am I finding that those cards are staying in there longer and longer? Yeah, and I'm not saying that's the way you have to do it. I'm saying that we can make, you want to do this better? We can find ways to make ourselves accountable and track our progress. And the last thing we're going to talk about is find and encourage you and recognize how much power there is in teamwork. When you have someone that you have set aside to say, hey, once a week, we're going to reach out to each other. We're going to talk about how we have done this past week. Do you have any cards left in your wallet? Have you talked with someone about Jesus? Have you, did, do you want to join me? And we're going to go and knock on people's doors in my neighborhood. I'm going to go mow my, my friend's yard. Do you want to come join me with that? And we're going to try to show them the glory of God through that good work that they might rejoice and come to him. Find the power that is available in teamwork. You want to get better. You want to grow in evangelism. These are some ways that might help you to do that. As we wrap this up, let's take our minds back to Luke chapter 10. Because when you're going through this, and you're going, how do I do better? There's a few things that you can read, and I would encourage you to read them. Just read them every day. John chapter 4, Acts chapter 8. Read about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Read about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Read about Paul and the Philippian jailer. Read these passages again and again every day. You say, I have questions. How do I do it? That's God saying, this is how you do it. But also read Luke 10. How 
How many are here today and are ready to start living Luke 10? Love God, love your neighbor, go and do. Eight simple words which have a huge impact on the world. The, what, what I want you to know today is the opportunity to start living Luke chapter 10 begins right now, begins at this moment. To show your love for God, He has been made, Christ has been made both Lord and Christ. That is our Jesus. He is the King. You have an opportunity to show your love for him by being made right, by coming to him in submission, recognizing that he is that king. He is the one who has the right to rule in my life. He is the one that has the right to direct the way that I go. And he is the one that loves me enough to offer me freedom from my sin. Love God today by submitting to him as your king. Love your neighbor today. The opportunity is yours to begin before we even leave these buildings to start showing your love for your neighbor in tangible and real ways like the Samaritan who went and ministered to them when they needed it. The opportunity is yours to go and do. Let's grow. Let's ignite in evangelism. If there is some way that we can help you this morning in beginning that, in continuing that, if there's something that you are struggling with, that you just need the prayers of the saints here, that is our purpose as a family. If we can assist you with that, come forward right now as we stand and sing.